Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's events. I'd like to welcome our online audiences and those of you who watch later on our YouTube channel. And I'd like to welcome David Damrosch here, uh, coming from Brooklyn, New York, uh, the author of Around the World in 80 Books and professor at Harvard University in Complet. So um, this is like a perfect book for the pandemic. Uh, nobody can travel. <laughs> So you want to go around the world, but, uh, but uh, do literary stops instead of culinary ones. Um, even better for our audience. So why don't you tell us about how you got the idea for, for such a book? Um, because it's, a, it's a, an interesting choice. And, and uh, well, well you, know, you really did a great job of pulling in all kinds of authors from all different times and, and, and places uh, using you, that structure. Well, I've been working on world literature for 20 years in various forms, uh, mostly for, for students and, and scholars. And I was thinking, well, it'd really be nice to show general readers some the enlarging landscape of, of literary, uh, the literary world uh, today. It's really exploded over the last generation or two, just what's available in excellent translations, what people are paying attention to, all kinds of things. World literature in the pre-modern era of the 1970s when I was a student, it meant Western European literature and mm -hmm. hardly anything else. And now we get this whole world out there and it is, even changes how differently we look at Europe itself in very new contexts. So I was thinking, well, it'd be nice to, to see, think how to present this uh, to a general reader who doesn't know uh, why they need to read these things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and in my case, uh, I thought, well, I need some kind of a narrative structure, a narrative line uh, and so I was thinking, all right, around the world in 80 books, I thought of Gerald's Verne, uh, and I was, I was going to go around uh, the world uh, last year and revisit a bunch of places that, that mattered to me uh, and talk about books that, that were there. Then COVID hits. I, I get in one last trip to Muscat, uh, where I get to know the work of Joko Alharti, who is one of my, my authors. Uh, but then all these things got canceled I was supposed to be doing in Japan and in Serbia mm -hmm. and then uh, elsewhere, uh, Chicago, I just couldn't go around the world. So I thought, oh, gee, I can't do the project. But then I thought, well, I've got the books. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then I thought of another book. Uh, there's a great uh, short work by a guy named Javier de Mestre, uh, who was, a, who was a, a French nobleman who was fighting the Piedmontese army in the 1790s. And, and he gets into a duel and the judge quarantines him, literally sentences, sentences him to his room for 42 days, very close to the quarantine, which is 40 days. And he decides to treat his room as the world. So he does a grand tour of his room. Voyage autour de ma chambre. I thought, ah, <laughs> that plus Vern, I've got a book. So that was a basic, <laughs> basic idea. And then since I couldn't go anywhere, uh, but really felt the need to get out, uh, I did it first as a blog online uh, in the summer of 20, uh, uh, 2020. Uh, and so Jules Verne had 80, 80 days. So I took 80 books in 80 days, uh, four months, uh, 16 weeks, uh, five books a week with the weekends off to pretend there was a weekend in that yeah, time, right, right, right. time and collapse. <laughs> uh, and, and so it became a much more conversational project uh, than it probably would have been if I was just writing ordinary prose uh, mm -hmm. with a lot of interaction of, of people following it at the time around the world. Yeah, it's interesting how. Um... Well, we just did a program on Dante, for example, and uh, we were expecting, you know, the usual kind of reaction. And uh, there's a, obviously an interest all around the world on Dante, and you, you, you reach that group. Um, and it can be, you know, tens of thousands of people, um, but, but you wouldn't expect that. They're not all in San Francisco, that's for sure. Um, so so it, it's a fascinating thing. And the Internet, obviously, um, during the pandemic has... has uh, upshifted its role uh, quite a bit because we're all stuck at home. And I think a number of my people who are following the blog 
point said it was kind of therapeutic for them to have this thing every day to look at uh, mm -hmm. and I would get reactions. It's so different from academic publishing where you write something takes maybe a year for press to pull it out, another year for book reviews. Here within mm -hmm. minutes, uh, you could get responses and actually change the shape of the project. For example, we have, we have Tagore as one of my 80 authors. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to be there originally, but but a follower in Delhi says, you're coming to India. How can you not have Tagore? So, yeah, right. Have Tagore. <laughs> well, he was right about that, David. <laughs> That's a now, good choice. Worked well. So let's let's yeah, so let's talk about Rabindranath Tagore, right? Rabindranath. Yeah. So you 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 bring him in um, and compare him to right after Rudyard Kipling. And I thought that was a very interesting pairing. So why don't we talk about your pairing in this way? of Rudyard Kipling, which you had a nice uh, expansive point of view on, uh, given the way a lot of people feel about him right now, and, and Tagore, uh, and Tagore's reaction to Kipling. So why don't you talk about that? Because that was a very fascinating part of your book. Yeah, thank you. It was part of the project for me with each, each chapter with five works is to bring them into conversation and to pick works that will interact well with each other within whatever is the theme of a given, uh, a given chapter. Uh, that chapter uh, on sort of centered in in Calcutta uh, is is really about uh, about rewriting empire, the aftermath of empire, what it's like, um, and very much in terms of how a a work reaches the world through an imperial network, which is already true of Kipling. I've been very interested in Kipling for quite a while in this respect. Um, uh, he rapidly goes from being a very local Anglo-Indian writer who assumes mm. he's writing just for readers of the newspaper where he's publishing, uh, the civil and military Gazette in Lahore, uh, mm. to then realizing he's getting published all around the world. Mm. Uh, uh, by the time he's 25 years old, he's being published in England, in, uh, in Australia, in the United States, multiple publishers. So he's writing for a global audience uh, from the very beginning of his career. I think he's really the first global author in that mm -hmm. sense, self-consciously global author. Uh, and of course, he's very closely associated with the imperial uh, enterprise, uh, the great game, as he as he calls it. Mm -hmm. uh, he then pro uh, provides a very nice figure to play off against, uh, both with Tagore, uh, who comes next. Uh, and the, and I, I, it's kind of a process of weaving together the connections. So they win the Nobel Prize just a few years apart from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, the first two identified with India uh, to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, and, and Tagore, of course, the first uh, Asian, actually, to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, but also Tagore himself gets there because of, a, of an Anglophone imperial network, because he's in England with his translation he's done of his Gitanjali, uh, shows it to Yeats. Yeats adores it, writes this glowing preface, and the next year he wins the Nobel Prize in 1913. Wow. Uh, so it's very interesting how these figures, I'm really interested in the, both how the figures often go around the world. Either the fictions are about going around the world or as with Dante going into the, around the universe, around mm -hmm. the cosmos, but also mm -hmm. often traveling. So with Tagore, works out uh, nicely because I mean, Kipling is a restless figure who lives for extended periods you know, in, um, in Vermont, uh, also is, visits uh, South Africa, Rhodesia very often, uh, India and, and England both. And then Tagore, when he becomes famous, suddenly he's a very Bengal, Bengali writer, but he makes a world tour. Uh, soon after this, in the year in which he publishes and the book I talk about, The Home of the World. Um, months after that, he's interviewed uh, in New York. I talk about a, uh, an interview with a newspaper. And my great aunt Helen, who is an artist, does a, a portrait of him. Mm -hmm. uh, and I put that in. Part of my, my interest in the book is to think of how works connect to our lives. So I use a little bit uh, my own life as, a, as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then, then Tagore has such a different uh, 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 anti-imperialist uh, view. But he's also building on an Anglophone tradition, as is Kipling. He grows up uh, reading, uh, you know, all kinds of you know, Victorian novelists, but also Robert Browning, the poet. Tagore is first a poet and second a novelist, as well as uh, all kinds of works in the Sanskrit and, and 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 Bengali tradition. So I go on from there, also into other writers who are playing off against those figures. Mm -hmm. Uh, I thought it was interesting that you, you uh, I mean, Kipling is, of course, identified and, and uh, you know, having called something the white man's burden uh, that he wrote was, uh, was a tough thing to live down at this point. Um, but you, you, you walk that back a bit. Um, and, and in addition to covering that, one of the other things that you just mentioned was that your, your aunt, your great aunt Helen uh, drew uh, Tagore when he was in town. Now, you said that somebody suggested Tagore to you. How did you find out? once Tagore was suggested to you that your great aunt Helen had drawn him? Because that's, you know, you, you didn't start with your great aunt. 
That's right. You found, you found it out later, I, I assume. Yeah. Well, it's an integrative process um, so that uh, in many cases, part of the, the challenge and also the fun of doing the project the way I did it one book a day uh, last summer of last year is that it's, I mean, it's, it's not like you're used to writing as an academic. It, uh, mm -hmm. You have a month or two to write on one author. Suddenly every day, it's not just writing 1500 words a day, but it's a different book every day. But this means that it's all in your head all at once and things start mm -hmm. to start to interact. With the case of Dugur, once I decided, thanks to this, uh, this guy in Delhi, he says I really had to have him, that, well, now how can I bring this in? Or oh, I could see it works. I actually had this portrait of, of Tagore that my Aunt Helen had had made because uh, mm -hmm. I'd inherited it from her. Uh, so, so it's a bit of a, uh, of a legacy. I thought, oh, this will be interesting uh, to, to put right in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. Uh, what about, I mean, let's, let's talk about your family just a, a, a second before. I mean, one of your uh, relatives, a great grandfather, I think, or something like that, founded Juilliard, uh, Juilliard School. My great grandfather, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you and, and, and there were several other stories like that in your, in your uh, essays of how these things are connected. And I thought, as you said, it was, it was a way of connecting this world of literature. I, I wonder sometimes, you know, people, uh, of course, in the world of literature, are all the writers writing about other writers and writing their own things. And so there's a particular point of view. But I wonder what percentage of the population is actually part of that subculture of humanity. Um, I mean, I think there are other uh, repressed subcultures that probably have more people interested in them than, than there are interested in the literary subculture. Um, even though the literary subculture has always dominated the, the, the visibility in a culture. So I was wondering if you wanted to talk about that a little bit, about, about you know, how, how the literary world at the universities and so on. I mean, we, you teach a lot of students, but they don't all become part of this literary thing. They, they read it a couple of times and then they go on to whatever else they do and, and, and they're slightly affected, but that's not part of their, their day to day life. So why don't you talk about how big you think this literary world actually is? Well, that's really interesting. I, um, in, what I think is that literature really exists in two different kinds of networks. Um, one is a network of the authors themselves uh, who are uh, writing often, they're always responding to other authors. And often mm -hmm. one of my themes is uh, authors, not only from their own country, but also from other elsewhere in the world. It, it takes a whole world to make one author. I think everyone's always reacting to all kinds of things. Derek Walcott is reading T.S. Eliot and Dante. Um, mm -hmm. When he's 18 years old, he's using them both in his earliest poetry there in this small island in the Caribbean. So mm -hmm. there's that network, the network of books and the kind of great conversation. But the other network is the synapses in our own brain. So mm -hmm. literature comes to life as we read, along with whatever else is rattling around in our brain. So it relates both to the other books we have just read, whether or not they have read each other, we have just read them. And we're going mm -hmm. to start to make connections. We're going to see similarities. We're going to see differences. And it relates to whatever else is going on in our own lives. And this seems to be very interesting because I'm really fascinated by how writers who often grow up in very difficult circumstances are dealing with some kind of trauma, whether it's personal, societal, you know, it's empire or it's war or it's you know, mm -hmm. poverty. Uh, and they can often create themselves through becoming writers. Uh, and they somehow turn their own traumas into lasting artifacts of pleasure and beauty, then we, as we read these things, are doing something the same as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's sort of why the, the personal comes in uh, to some extent uh, for, for me, just as an example of what any of us, how we will always sort of build uh, our lives partly around what we read and read ourselves to some way in, in the stuff we're reading. It's interesting to me because... Um... People uh, just in their imaginations wish that they could read other people's minds. Uh, but the interesting thing is now that we have the Internet and all the chat rooms, you know, how everybody reacts to things, you, you get a really clear idea that you really don't want to know what's going on in most people's minds. <laughs> you really don't want. But in the case of these writers, at least among those who, who are appreciative, this is what you're doing with them. You, you get into their mind. And you, you look at the world through their eyes, whether they're writing fiction or nonfiction or anything, and, and you, you get something that's comfortable to be in their mind. Sometimes it's a lot com very comfortable, and then there are a few things that are a little off or that, that make you uncomfortable. But then these great world-beating writers that are all reacting to each other, it's always pretty nice to be, share, share a couple of hours uh, with how they're thinking. And a lot of people are worried about the internet, for example, ruining literature. Uh, I remember when computers, oh, that'll be terrible. You know, 
to ruin literature, but actually it's a lot easier to redraft something with a computer than it is when you chisel it in stone, you know, 5,000 years ago um, or, or any other kind of writing before now, you, you, it's, it's painless to make a change. I'm, I don't know if you wrote in the seventies or before the computers, but you know, you type it all up and you say, do I really want to make that change and retype that whole page or not? Now, now it's like nothing. So, um, and it also it's, seems to, yeah, go ahead. There's been this, I think it's forever, this discourse, oh, the latest technology has ruined literature. Right, uh, right. Henry, Henry James, in one of his prefaces, says, oh, writing just isn't the same uh, since the invention of the steel pen. It was so yeah. much better when it was quill pens. You know? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, th there's always that discourse. And it, it always turns out, partly because, of course, you know, let's say most of what's being written on the Internet is junk or is crap. But, mm. but then most Petrarchan sonnets in the 16th century were junk. We only right. read the few greatest ones. And, and things will sort out, including what's on the internet. I'm quite interested in internet fictions, internet art. And there's some really, really interesting work being done. A lot of, with a lot of stuff that's not that interesting. Right. But generally, going back to your first uh, comment just now, I really feel that literature, and I'm kind of annoyingly kind of optimistic about, about literature. Uh, <laughs> a lot of my friends, I'm, I'm kind of not so happy about uh, politics in the, our world today. Uh, but I feel that literature is a, it's the highest form of the use of language. It's a privileged mode of communication. We need more than ever. And in particular, I work a good deal in ancient literature. And uh, if you're looking at, um, I mean, see so you're wearing the, the Rosetta Stone on your necktie. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, you, if you go to Luxor and Karnak and Thebes, if you're just seeing the pyramids, it's magnificent, but you don't know what they're thinking. But mm -hmm. if you read what's on the walls, if you read the papyri that have been turned up from the tombs, then you're getting into their minds. And it's mm -hmm. startling how mm -hmm. similar they are in some respects, even as in other respects, they have completely different ideas of how the universe works uh, mm -hmm. and, and even how society works. So that fascination of proximity, closeness, and distance uh, is, is what we get by entering in someone else's imaginative world. One of my favorite things from the hier hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt, maybe 5,000 years old, uh, is uh, from a teacher. And the teacher is complaining that the students aren't as respectful as they used to be. You know, and it's exactly the same story you hear over and over again. And you, and you realize when you read that, the problem is not the students. The problem is that when you start teaching, you're only a couple of years older than the students. And as time goes by, the gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, of course, the relationship changes. Um, well, well that, that passage you mentioned uh, from the papyrus Lansing is so cool because the, the guy says, Though I, your, your heart is denser than an obelisk. Though I beat you with every kind of stone, you do not learn. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing about this, that I think that's what you have in mind. It's so yeah, cool yeah. because we have it because it's a teaching text. It's very clever reverse psychology. He's giving students his complaining about reading in order to teach them to read. Right. Clever pedagogical <laughs> strategy 4,000 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it, and as you said, uh, you know, we wouldn't say with an obelisk, you know, but other than that, it sounds exactly the same as, as, as what we would do, right? We would not perhaps beat the student with every kind of stick. <laughs> That's, That's only 50 years old. Up. I mean, it's, 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 it's only been 50 years since we changed that one. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, the other point before we go back to the authors is, uh, in, I'm, I'm also an optimist about literature. And I, also, I think if you just say that with the internet access, you're going to have all kinds of people throughout the world in the next generation, next two generations, and so on, who are going to be able to read anything that they want to for almost no money, basically. I mean, it'll, they might have to go to the library because they can't get a computer. <clears throat> but other than that, there's like no obstacle. Um, and that, that ought to produce a lot more very diverse points of view that also converse with world literature. Now, on the other side of that, I think it makes all the more necessary to have some kinds of guides uh, yeah. to the perplexed. Uh, there's so much stuff out there. How do you choose? So part of my purpose with this book is saying there's many ways to look at world literature. Here's one set. Here's one pathway mm -hmm. you can look at. And I assume that, I mean, hoping that I mean, the book is a freestanding book, a kind of meditation on what literature does. But I trust that uh, most readers will then be drawn to read or reread some favorite works. Different people choose different ones. When I'm teaching a world literature course, my utopian Hope is that every student unexpectedly will be realizing they need to learn a new language they never thought they needed to learn, which actually yeah. happened to me more than once. I mean, I learned Italian because of reading Dante and Italo Calvino, and mm -hmm. I learned uh, Nahuatl because of reading an English translation of a Spanish translation of Aztec poetry that just blew me away. 
Well, you mentioned Utopia, so why don't we go to Thomas More uh, as Utopia and and uh, the reactions to that uh, because that's a that's one whole uh, subgenre of what's going on. Um, it, it was uh, fascinating, among other things, because he's known a certain way that you you include his tombstone uh, epitaph about his two wives, which I thought was very interesting. So here's a utopian thinker who's which is a joke to him, pretty much. Um, you know his uh, critique of the current time by by using that approach. But in any case, why don't you talk a little bit about that, and then we'll talk about the reaction to that. Yeah, Moore is really, really interesting to me in, on so many levels. I, I teach him all the time. I do a course, a general education course called The Philosopher and the Tyrant. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of my examples, I, I'll pair a, a, a writer with a political figure. So uh, Moore and, and uh, Henry VIII is really interesting because at the time he's writing uh, Utopia early in his life, Young Henry VIII looks like this Renaissance man, this perfect humanist. Uh, he's, mm -hmm. he's a poet, he's, he's a composer, he reads all these languages, and then he turns into this increasingly tyrannical figure. Uh, early on in Utopia, uh, uh, one of the characters says, well, you never go into politics because it'll kill you. Mm -hmm. And guess what happens uh, to, yeah, to yeah. Moore <laughs> a few decades later. So it is quite striking in that case to think yeah. of it. At the same time, Moore is interesting to me. And of course, part of the selection for principle of selection of these merely 80 books out of all the ones I might have taken is that it will work on several levels. So Moore's life is so dramatic this way, but it's also, it's the first major work of world literature that has seen the entire globe, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 1516, if that's what it is. You know, it's just a few years after Columbus's voyage and, and Vespucci's voyages uh, and, and more uh, imagines that he's learning about utopia from one of Vespucci's own uh, sa sailors. Uh, who's, who's gone gone ashore in Brazil and wandered across the continent. So you suddenly have this tremendous expansion of the globe and thinking about this remarkable foreignness uh, of cultures that had never had any contact before. Yeah. So now you, when you take Utopia and then you, you, you I think you also uh, talk about the handmaiden as a reaction, Margaret Atwood's work and stuff like that. So uh, we've had this Utopia, which was not intended to be yeah, I, I like what you said about uh, you, Mars Utopia versus Plato's Republic. You know, it's mm. a de de democratization of 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 that uh, more aristocratic mm -hmm. idea that Plato had two thousand years earlier. But you also then go into the dystopias that that are in reaction to that. So why don't we talk about somebody modern for a second? You can pick which one you want. Yeah. Um, so in many of these chapters, you know, a lot probably the predominance of my, my of these books are are relatively modern um, mm -hmm. uh, and. You know, so utopia and dystopia were also what the uh, French philosopher Foucault calls heterotopia are really interesting. These sort of other spaces that give you an angle on the mm -hmm. world. And I think that's what literature is almost uh, uh, always doing. And these dystopias, I mean, that, that chapter ends, um, well, I go to, to Voltaire's Candide, who, who also mm -hmm. then goes to, to El Dorado uh, into Brazil in a kind of utopian space. And his is a techno-utopia. Uh, so whereas Moore is in a kind of humanist world, now it's a technological world. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of the rise of modern science. That chapter ends with Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude, uh, in mm -hmm. which Macondo is a dystopic utopia. It's a very interesting combination yeah. of the two, infused with now modern politics, but also that whole tradition and, he's, and direct reference back to back to Moore. So it ties it together. Margaret Atwood, whom you mentioned, uh, I, I use her her uh, her Penelope ad in one of my other chapters. I, I mentioned also the Handmaid's uh, mm -hmm. Tale and and the Testaments. Just to say a little plug for Atwood, the Testaments, which came out just a couple of years ago and won the Booker Prize, is a rare case I think in the history of literature of a sequel written decades later that's even better than the prequel. Uh, the mm -hmm. Testaments is an amazing, amazing, amazing book. Uh, but but so so with the Penelope ad, really interesting. Uh, so she's she's re redoing um, the story of the Odyssey from the point of view of. Penelope is very ironic uh, <laughs> uh, take, uh, yeah. and and Ithaca becomes a kind of dystopia also uh, for her, uh, an mm -hmm. island space again, like Utopia, an island space, and it's a little sort of microcosm, uh, uh, microcosm there. Interestingly, just on on the the value of the internet here, uh, one of the nicest things that happened with the blog version of this book uh, is that uh, so when I did the posting on uh, the Penelope ad, Atwood. Uh, one of the followers was an editor in China, uh, mm -hmm. and she got interested. And that book is published in a small series by, by a, a small press called Canongate in, in uh, a Scottish press. 
uh, and the series is called Myths Today. Uh, mm -hmm. And and Canon Gate got various prominent authors to retell some classic tales. So America, that's what Olga Tokarczuk, who's one of my authors, is, is retelling the story of Inanna. Philip Pullman retells the story of Jesus. Now that's an interesting choice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so this editor in China, reading my posting on, on the uh, Penelope ad, got interested and got in touch with the Canon Gate and is now doing the entire series in Chinese translation. Wow. So the books are coming out. This just made my day. Yes, I'm sure it did. <laughs> And it's and it is you know one of the as you said one of the big advantages of the internet. It only takes one person in another location, but I but I would say you know because a lot of people when they look back three thousand years and say well these two cultures didn't didn't have any contact with each other and therefore how how could they influence each other? But it only takes one person traveling, you know, to bring an idea about Buddhism to Jerusalem, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And and I, I think that that's. It's probably a mistake. I think there was much more, there wasn't that much movement, but there was enough movement between the cultures that they, I'm sure they influence each other. Uh, a lot, uh, more than, you know, and we've lost so many of the records, so we don't know. But I remember one time yeah. I was in, um, in the Republic of Georgia uh, and uh, eating a national dish, which is a kind of, uh, uh, come back to taste, it reminded me of dim sum. I said, this seems remarkably like what I was just eating in Hong Kong. They said, well, yeah, Silk Road. <laughs> no surprise to them, you know. And people certainly brought stories and songs mm. along with the uh, dim sum. Right, exactly. Uh, the food probably traveled even more than the <laughs> than the literature. Well, but, what are you doing uh, while you're eating? You're gonna you're gonna talk. You're gonna tell stories. Uh, exactly. Simultaneously. Exactly. So um, let's uh, switch to Joseph Conrad as be, uh, in the Heart of Darkness. Um, you mentioned how other people just now were rewriting different stories and stuff like that, you know, and, and actually uh, one of my short stories is the, is called the God desire and it's a rewrite of the heart of darkness. So it's, it's exactly, exactly what you're talking about. And I made it, you know, different. I put it in Peru, but basically the same yeah. idea. So, so um, his reaction uh, at, at pretty much the same time, but give his background. It's amazing that, that somebody from another country, uh, on his third or fourth language is considered one of the great stylists in the English language. And that maybe, maybe most people don't, aren't aware of that. Why don't you tell a little bit about him? Uh, again, he's a, he's a fascinating figure, a really global figure. Uh, and of course, his novels and stories are set all around the world. You have Malaysia mm -hmm. and you have South America, you have the uh, uh, Sulaco and Nostromo, a fantastic mm -hmm. novel, uh, to speak of South, South America. And of course, Heart of Darkness and the uh, growing, you know, he 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 runs away from. So he's uh, he grows up in what is now Poland. Uh, he was never a Polish citizen. Uh, it was the uh -huh. Russian Empire at the time. He, he runs away to the merchant, French merchant marine uh, for years, and then uh, finally decides about age forty to become a writer. At this point, he's settled in in England. Uh, still trying mm -hmm. to decide: is he going to is this writing thing going to work out? Is it go back to sea in the British merchant marine? He finally decides to do this, and this is one of the. The really key things he writes early on, 1899, looking back at his own unhappy few months in the Congo as a, as a steamboat pilot. So Conrad interests me in very more than one. So probably for the book, I'm looking to kind of weave not only within chapters, but across. So I have a chapter on uh, centered on Poland earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Conrad kind of, you get a kind of cycling return just as utopias appear in various points in the book, things like that. <clears throat> and then Conrad you know, it's problematic for African writers. So in some way he puts Con the Congo on the map uh, mm -hmm. for a world audience. Uh, but as Chino Achebe notes, uh, <clears throat> no Africans have a real voice anywhere in, the, in that right. book. <clears throat> and Achebe's take is that it's really a racist work. And Achebe is rewriting Heart of Darkness uh, in the most successful uh, widely read African novel ever written, uh, Things Fall Apart. And then we see <clears throat> Wale Shoenka, an early friend and kind of disciple of Achebe, uh, rewriting Achebe. Uh, we see Chimamanda Adichie, uh, whom I close with in that chapter, uh, again, rewriting Heart of Darkness at the final story in your collection of thing around your neck. And now you have a feminist perspective. Uh, it's very interesting how these things rework uh, across, across different voices. It's part of the conversation though. And it seems to me, you know, that we're, we're, there's, there's some people who think, you can't write or you should not write about anything that is not your own personal experience within your particular culture and your particular, that kind of thing, instead of you coming here and, and bothering us by writing about us, that kind of thing. But 
I, I suspect pretty strongly that if, if it hadn't been for the heart of darkness, that the reaction to King Leopold, uh, you know, a few years later would not have been nearly as strong or as, as known, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to all the our cultures sharing with each other and everybody making comments. And then, you know, it's great that uh, Chibi comes back and says, yeah, that's that's your point of view. This is this is not how we see ourselves, of course. Um, and and obviously we have got Africa totally wrong for a long, long time in, in the way that we uh, analyze their cultures. But, but interaction is still, you know, because now we have the Chinese all over Africa and it'll be interesting to see if there'll be Chinese writers that come out of that, that have uh, their perspective on it. That's a future thing. Yeah, so you, you, you use Conrad as part of your Polish thing. Also, you, you uh, mentioned uh, Czeslo Malos, uh, the poet and his, his background. So, uh, why don't we talk about him a little bit? He's not so uh, not quite as well known, uh, but but uh, an excellent poet. Oh, before I forget, it's very interesting. Uh, I think that the Nobel Prize has been an internationalizing thing for a long time. That is, you wouldn't expect it from a big prize like that that they would have been uh, so devoted to finding pieces all over the world. Do you know any of the history of why that happened? And then we'll go to Milos. It's was there something in the politics of, of the Nobel Prize Committee that did that? or it, it's, it's been an evolution uh, over time. It's, uh, I think the, the committee over the last 20 or 30 years has really embraced the fact that they have gotten the kind of world status that no other prize has. And that's because it's virtually the only important literary prize that is not national. Almost mm -hmm. every single other prize is really national. Even that's beginning to change now. There's a Man Booker International Award, but that's very mm -hmm. new. It was always the best British and maybe the best Anglophone. Now it's also translational. It's moving. But but mm -hmm. the, the Pulitzer the National Book Award, all these, all these awards and all around the world. So people began to look to, to them by about just after the, after the Second World War. And before the World War II, it was, it was pretty much a Nordic uh, mm -hmm. and, Europe, and nearby European uh, thing. Uh, but they, they began to, to see... You could almost say a market niche for themselves, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. kind of a mission. I mean, they, they feel very strongly. I was, I was talking to one of the members of the Nobel Committee some years ago, not long after Mo Yan uh, won the Nobel Prize. And I said, well, you know, people often say, oh, it was time for China. Do you feel it was a political choice? He said, I think Mo Yan is the best writer alive today. That was his answer. <laughs> yeah. Pure and yeah. simple. Uh, yeah. and, and they take a certain pride, which you see, as with Miloš, in recent decades in kind of fixing on, on a writer who's not the, the, the flavor of the month, who's not internationally known. Miloš was almost unknown um, outside a very small immigrant community uh, when he got the prize. He was banned uh, at home. Uh, he was teaching at Berkeley. Uh, mm. A number of his colleagues learned that he wrote poetry for the first time when he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> or Nagib Mahfouz was, was largely banned uh, in the mm. Arab world on political and religious grounds. And then he wins the Nobel Prize and suddenly discover they have a world-class writer that they should pay attention to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's an amazing, an amazing uh, shift. And I mean, they use their power very interestingly. And uh, it, it certainly... You know, and, it, and, it's, and a it's a bit scattered out at times. I mean, should they have yeah. given the prize to Bob Dylan? I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we, I have an institute of world literature that meets in the summers um, uh, to sort of train people, teach world literature, and we're meeting um, not the, Nick, the year after that in Copenhagen, and we had a talk by the secretary of the committee, Sarah Danius, who then stepped down over, uh, there were a, a sexual scandal that, that the old yeah. guys were not willing to face, uh, she was outraged. But, but, she, but she was saying, oh, this, this is just like folk songs and like Herda, uh, and we're not, we're not lowering our standards. It was rather defensive talk, I think, that got <laughs> beaten up by quite a bit by that. As much as I love Dylan's poetry, there might have been a few uh, other writers or even other songwriters I might have picked first. But. <laughs> but, but someone on the committee had grown up with Dylan, I'm sure. Clearly, <laughs> clearly. And speaking of growing up, I mean, you, you mentioned that, that uh, you got started with Tristan Shandy. Uh, Lawrence Stern's Tristram Chat, which is a, a, an unusual choice. And, and I, I, I loved it that you, you said that you, you tried out Dante's Divine Comedy because you thought it was going to be a joke. As funny, uh, as, funny <laughs> as, as Lawrence Stern. It wasn't quite the knee slapper I thought I was getting into. I was 15 years old. Uh, and I th it was a little bit, you know, starting this book, I wanted to be not just like kind of the Harvard professor pontificating, but to, to, to bring my readers back in what it's like to discover something when you mm. don't know what it is. And the kind of joy of discovering, which for me at age 16, 
uh, 15, I would have with English literature. Now I would still have with Chinese literature or, or Persian poetry. And that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's part of the real pleasure of it. Uh, just to go back quickly to this, this point about how appropriate is it for us to enter a world we don't know? So you right. you write a story set in Peru, you're not Peruvian, right? Uh, yep. But, you know, Voltaire thought that was not a problem. You right. know, <laughs> Saul Bellow, I talk about Henderson, the Rain King, set in Africa where he'd never been. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and dealing with that, you want to, you have to be thoughtful about what it means. You don't think that Bellow is going to tell you about Africa from inside. That's not why mm-hmm. you read Bellow. He's using it as a way to satirize his own culture and to sort of think of himself as the opposite to himself. And I compare it to Voltaire doing the same thing with Brazil. So as long mm-hmm. as you know what you're doing, it seems to me uh, uh, to work to work well. With, with Stern, I just fell in love with it. It was so so lively, so sexy, so meta-fictional. I thought, oh, mm-hmm. where is there more like this? Uh, and Stern, of course, is his life and opinions. He can barely talk about his life because he has so many opinions. And he speaks of <laughs> my, my dear Rabelais and my dear Cervantes. So I didn't know who those guys were, but I thought, all right, if he likes them, I should like them. And it mm-hmm. was really interesting because it's just a passing reference, but he already, he's already showing a difference. He loves Rabelais and he loves Cervantes even more. And he was mm-hmm. right. I mean, there's reasons why Cervantes yeah. has been that much more influential on the whole history of literature, but they were fantastic. Then I go to Dante, hoping for another relic in comedy. <laughs> uh, it wasn't quite. Then after that, I'm a preacher's kid. I thought, okay, yes, I really like this deeply serious spiritual stuff. What else can I read that's really going to be like that? I say, ah, Dead Souls, Nikolai Gogol. Yeah. And discover yeah. it's a sparkling satire that I thought I was going to yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Uh, dead souls and then and then it's uh, you you often talk about the ones that come later but there's the master and margarita by uh, bogakov uh, from the 20th century in the soviet union mm-hmm. where it's a it's a similar not not similar in any way but it all uh, the same sort of uh russian attitude towards bureaucracy etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah uh fan- fantastically presenting it um, which you can also that's also one thing that comes up interestingly uh these kinds of connections again you we can make when we read something uh, so we're interested to say I have Kafka, who's you know one of the great poets of horrible bureaucracy. But then Wu Chang'an, uh, his novel *A Journey to the West* uh, mm-hmm. from the, the 1600s, uh, which is a kind of a Buddhist, uh, Taoist, spiritual thing. They're going to India to get Buddhist scriptures. Uh, but it's, there's a lot also about satirizing the bureaucracy of his own time. It's mm-hmm. based on an actual travel of a monk a thousand years earlier. But now it's that the author is processing his own situation, again, at a distance of mm-hmm. time and, and, and fiction. There's a great moment uh, where they, uh, they finally get to the West. They, get, they meet the Buddha himself who, gives, who says, yeah, we'll give you all the scriptures you need to take back uh, to become less barbarous, uh, you poor uh, benighted <laughs> people. You need the true, the true knowledge here. Uh, and, and he tells his assistants, oh, go, go to the library, give them a bunch of, of the scrolls. Uh, but, the, but the pilgrims who have come from China, they, they neglect to, to bribe the assistants which the assistants expect to bribe. And so right. the, to, to get back to them, the assistants give them blank scrolls. They get halfway home, they discover there's nothing in the scrolls. They come back weeping, say, oh, the Buddha, we didn't get the scrolls. And the Buddha says, I knew that. The blank scrolls are the true scrolls. <laughs> it's this wonderful, like, explode. but because you are fallen people, I will give you scrolls with words on them if you really need them. <laughs> So the whole bureaucratic stuff is just fascinating. And so, you know, we can put that together now because already yeah. the, the Chinese are dealing with a very elaborated modern bureaucracy in the 17th century. Right. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably just like the uh, ancient hieroglyphic stuff about teachers. I'm sure you can find a bureaucracy at any time um, behaving a certain way because how does a bureaucracy work except for by departmentalization and obedience to the rules? You know, that's, it'd be pretty hard if you let all of them make up their own decisions all the time. And it works by <clears throat> the bureaucrats and finding their way around the rules. Yes, exactly. You, you see this in ancient Assyrian letters. There's letters in the palace of Nineveh in which these mm-hmm. scribes are writing to each other. And, you know, uh, your majesty, you're, you know, where am I going to put the, the wine? There's too much, there's too much wine has arrived. Where am I going to put it? Uh, and, the, you know, uh, they're trying to, uh, they're, they're sort of, uh, uh, trying to outdo the fellow bureaucrat on, you know, I want more space. Uh, right, right. <laughs> and, and we know if there was too much wine, some of it ended up in their homes. <clears throat> <That's right. laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I spent a little time in the Soviet Union one summer in 73. And, uh, you know, <laughs> people were worried about this, you know, totalitarian. You know, but the further away you got from Leningrad and, and Moscow, uh, the more that everybody was just working around the system. 
you know, the, 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 even even the even the local uh, bureaucrats were working around the national system. And I think that's just uh, people who think that a world government would suppress everybody uh, have no experience with national governments who can't do it. You know, it's like just you know, no, nobody can do this to us. It's, it, it, they can make life really obnoxious. Uh, there's no question about that. But they can't completely suppress everything. So uh, speaking of not suppressing everything, um, let's talk about uh, some of the areas that were unusual, like uh, Cairo. Let's talk about the Cairo writer, because you spent a week sort of in that area. Yes, so I have worked uh, a while or off and on 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 more ancient Egyptian material, Middle Egyptian, Mm -hmm. uh, and have become increasingly interested just in the, the, the liveliness of uh, of, of Cairo as a, as a location. So it has, you know, I, I wanted places that, that have a critical mass of really great, great writing. What's so interesting mm-hmm. to me about Egypt is this incredible depth of history uh, going, going back so far. So Nagib Mahfouz, who's one of my authors, uh, in his mm-hmm. Nobel Prize speech, which is a beautiful speech uh, that you can see online, uh, he, he, he talks about himself as a, as, a, as a child of two cultures, and you might expect he would say oh, it's, it's the British novel tradition that he's writing in, or the European novel mm-hmm. plus the Arabic tradition. But he says, no, it's, it's the Arabic tradition and the Pharaonic tradition mm-hmm. going back uh, 5,000 years. Uh, mm-hmm. And then later he got to know, got to know Europe. Uh, and that, kind of, that, that depth uh, of, of culture is so fascinating uh, to me. Uh, and then you see with Mahfouz uh, how he's kind of, he's again uh, playing also on the broader Arabic tradition of the uh, Thousand and One Nights. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, I start with an early Egyptian case, the very first frame, frame tales called, that we have preserved are called the story of the shipwrecked sailor. I talk about that and also about mm-hmm. Egyptian love poetry. Uh, and I'm interested there in thinking about stories within stories, nested stories. So that's a kind of a theme there. And just Cairo to me is nested histories itself. And then mm-hmm. it produces these writers who love these nested stories, whether it's the, the Cairo manuscripts, which are so important, the Thousand One Nights, uh, and that the Thousand One Nights itself is an international text, but then it gets localized in a given tradition where the manuscripts will get developed either in Syria mm-hmm. uh, or, or, or earlier in Baghdad, but later in Syria and, and in Cairo. Uh, so uh, I love this kind of uh, combination of, um, uh, of, of depth and variety of this incredibly lively uh, society that you have in Egypt. It was interesting, uh, the, the, just to the side on the love songs that you that you did. I mean, mm. very very nice poetry and and, and ancient. I remember reading, uh, you know, uh, an an essay that was based upon a PhD thesis, and the PhD thesis it was like seventies or eighties was that romance between men and women began at, at the time of the troubadours. Uh, before that, it was always a business, uh, you know, and so forth. And I thought. You know, have you read nothing? <laughs> <laughs> have you seen nothing from from before? I mean, it's just uh, yeah. yes, there were people who did it as a business, but you know, the romance has been there forever, as far as human beings have been there. Anyway, uh, everybody knows that, except for this guy who was writing his PhD. Um, That's right. That's right. <laughs> and, and a lot so, of my interest in the literature open people's views out, like we didn't yeah. invent this. Our culture did not invent this. It's not even just a modern invention. Or even the modern way of looking at it is not only our way. Look at how differently London looks to different authors, how differently Japan looks to different authors at, given, at a given time and place. Yeah, uh, and you were very bold. Uh, you included in the Middle East uh, both uh, the old uh, the, the Bible, the Jew- Jewish Bible, and uh, the New Testament as forms of literature. And I, I really liked your take on the, the New Testament. It was a, 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 a new way of doing a particular kind of style. And, and also, they also were referencing back to other literature from, from before, and that was a big part of it. You used one example of how, how um, the one psalm was used when Jesus was dying. Um, uh, in two of them, why don't, you, why don't you explain that story? Because that's right. it's a nice literary point of view. <clears throat> yes. Um, so it's really interesting to me about, um, first in the, the, the section I have on the, on the Hebrew Bible, which I say very much in terms of migration and, and sort of the, the traumatic loss of cultural memory being swamped by one empire after another. Mm-hmm. And then uh, in the time of, of Jesus, you, you've got the soft power of Hellenistic culture along with the imperial power of, of Rome. And there's always this danger that it's going to just slip away. You get uh, upper class Jews who really can't read Hebrew very well anymore. They need the Bible translated for the first time into Greek. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and with the gospel writers are dealing with this fact that it's a very local 
uh, reform movement within Judaism, it suddenly goes global. And that's thanks to the global language of Hellenistic Greek, really, uh, mm -hmm. conveyed by the power of the Roman Empire, right? So the earliest gospel writers, they're really writing for a Jewish audience, and they quote Jesus' last words on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, which they quote in Aramaic, and then in, in, in Hebrew, in, in Matthew's case, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Uh, but they expect that the, their readers know that that's not a cry of existential despair. That is mm -hmm. the first line of a famous psalm. And, and because texts in the, near, in the ancient world were usually known by their first line, I I'm, I'm think very likely they expect Jesus is reciting that psalm to get through mm -hmm. the agony on, on the cross. But right. my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Leads to, oh my God, you have saved me. That's the right. point. Now, now the problem is then, what happens if you have a Greek audience that, that doesn't know the psalm? They're going to take this as a cry of existential despair. Now, mm -hmm. Kierkegaard might do that, but that is not what the authors intend. Jesus right. knows what his mission is. He's not thrilled to die on the cross, but he's accepting that burden that, that has been uh, put on him by God who's there with him. So, right. so Luke, he's still, uh, Jesus is citing a psalm. But Luke says, all right, I'll have him cite a different psalm. Uh, into the hands I commit my spirit, that mm -hmm. line from another psalm won't confuse the Greek reader who doesn't mm -hmm. know the psalm. It's just, okay, that's what he says. Then yeah. uh, 30 years later, John's gospel pretty much gives up the Hebrew connection altogether and just says, mm -hmm. it is completed. That's it. Doesn't even need a psalm at all. So right. here, Jesus's last words, which are incredibly important, are given in three different versions, depending on the audience that the writer is imagining. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a very, you know, among, among many other things in, in the New Testament, it's very interesting to take a literary point of view rather than a belief point of view on it, um, because you can, you can analyze it. As you just said, explain what the author's intent was as a writer. You can, can, it, you can tell what they were up to. No, it's, um, but I would say it's, I'm very much a both and kind of guy, and I'm a preacher's yeah. kid. So it's also a belief point of view, because uh, you have to say what do these authors believe. They believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he knows what he's mm -hmm. doing. Therefore, right. it cannot be what the modern uh, existentialist might think Jesus is in despair. The belief right. system does not allow that as a possibility. So then you have to do a literary analysis, figure out what's going on. Right. Perfect. Um, so now that we've covered that as literature <laughs> in just a couple of minutes, that's pretty good. Um, you're, you're, uh, you, you have so many other authors to, to choose from to discuss, um, but, but you finish with Tolkien. Um, we have a little bit more time, but I do not want to miss Tolkien. You, you give him a lot of credit, um, and obviously he was the joy of uh, your teenage years, too. Have you, first, have you reread it uh, as an adult? Did you ever sit down and reread it? I have, um, uh, and, and I, I teach Tolkien uh, periodically. Uh, uh, I teach him as the last of the World War I poets. Uh -huh. uh, really interesting because uh, he, he outlives most of those who tend to die young. All, all but one of his friends died in the trenches uh, in World mm -hmm. War One, but he was just wounded and got, got back home. But it's very much in that, in that connection. Right now, I'm actually listening to the audiobook for the first time. Uh -huh. uh, I'm only about 12 hours into the 60 hours of the <laughs> audiobook, uh, but it's amazing how much, what it brings out. And I recommend it highly. Uh, I hadn't realized what it, really what a pitch perfect ear Tolkien has for like rural English speech, the way the hobbits speak mm -hmm. and the incredible mm -hmm. skill he has in differentiating. So it's not just, he has a fantasy world and there's elves and dwarves and, and wizards, mm -hmm. which lots of other people have had partly influenced by him, but it, it is so nuanced and differentiated that mm -hmm. no two wizards sound alike or look alike. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the orcs, different groups of orcs are different. Indeed uh, in Mordor, the orcs, are debating each other and they sound like enlisted men in the trenches in World War I whose uh, generals have betrayed them. It's really, mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah, this is something that, of course, doesn't come out in the movies, um, you know, that the orcs have this uh, personal life. Uh, the, the movies, are, Jackson movie is so good, except I really, I'm sorry about the orcs because it's, it's a racist representation of the yellow peril. Yeah. Uh, I think those orcs are very unfortunate and that's so much more cartoonish than, than, than what Tolkien gives you. Right. Um, but makes for good, scary, uh, you know, war scenes and therefore exactly. must have been written into the budget, um, a big enough budget as it was. Um, talking about the, the interaction between it, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know what you think about J.K. Rowling's uh, creation of, of, of a not similar world, but, but very elaborate because Tolkien has spent, uh, as you mentioned in your, uh, in your book, 
he spent a lot of time creating a, a language, an, an elven language and, and so on and so forth. And clearly uh, she was playing off of Latin and a whole bunch of other things all the time, but also created a world that has successfully, you know, reached uh, hundreds of millions of people throughout the world. So uh, why don't you talk about their, their playing off of each other? Yeah, I would have been happy to include also uh, Rowling if I had a few more books. To have. <laughs> yeah, I think that she, my view is that she's triangulating brilliantly between Tolkien and Roald Dahl. Uh, mm-hmm. her, her muggles <laughs> world is the world of Roald Dahl's children's stories. And yeah. she's combining these things with then the British schoolboy story so it's like yeah. three things she's putting together. Uh, and that's what, she, she's a real magpie. Uh, and, and she really mm-hmm. makes her nest out of these scraps uh, that, mm-hmm. she, uh, that I think is, is brilliantly done. Uh, and, and, and very much you know, unimaginable without, without Tolkien as are a whole others uh, mm-hmm. series who uh, come in his wake. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's useful whenever something uh, rises above uh, the, the uh, level where everybody finds out about it in, in, in the culture and now in the whole world culture to, to see the roots um, that, as you were saying, and, and you, you make a big point of this in your book, see the roots. Almost every writer does it based upon the roots of, of, of what they like to read or what inspired them. And they might not even realize it. You know, it might be to a professor to notice what they've done. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes it, it can be that they just collected it all and then it came back out this way. Yeah. Um, but um, this is a to like go back to popular culture in a totally different way. Um, why do you think that that uh, vampires and and <laughs> and werewolves have made a comeback in the last thirty years in the movies and everything? I mean, it, it just seems where did that come from? All of a sudden, you know, I mean, there will always be movies like that, but all of a sudden, yeah, I, I don't understand. <laughs> so if you can explain it, <laughs> um, you know, I, I I do think that. Um, Fantasy worlds generally uh, provide different ways of, of dealing at a, at a safe distance with things that feel very unsafe to us, which is why, mm-hmm. so in a certain sense, what uh, World War I was for Tolkien uh, and secondarily mm-hmm. World War II, uh, all the stresses we're under in, in the world today uh, can be processed back through. And it, you know, you had, I think you had a big increase in vampire uh, stuff around the time of the AIDS crisis. People mm-hmm. are worrying about blood. People are worrying about sexuality, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I think that really uh, was kickstarted the, the return of, of vampires, uh, as mm-hmm. a matter of fact. Uh, and, and at the same time, then it, the creative uh, mind can, can do these genre fictions. One of the things that interests me with world literature is it's not just Dante and, and Homer uh, mm-hmm. and the Tale of Genji, these great masterpieces, but also have a bunch of detective stories. There, there's mm-hmm. no more worldwide genre than detective fiction. And those mm-hmm. writers are reading each other all over the place and, and doing very creative uh, plays on them. Even with vampires, just think, uh, you know, you get like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the TV series right. some, some years ago, uh, of which my uh, my favorite line is, uh, uh, Buffy says to her friend, does the word duh mean anything to you? <laughs> there's an incredible linguistic play going on in, in, yeah, in, the, in the best yeah. of these of these things. Same thing to one of the great main authors, Stephen King, uh, mm-hmm. uh, whom I, yeah. if I'd had room for more main authors, mm-hmm. but not specifically my part of Maine. But Maine, you know, I was going to say as in M A I N E. Yes, yes, the state of Maine, right? From. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, well, it, the, you talk about the detective story. You, you talk about Conan Dial and, and and Sherlock Holmes in your your, your book and other other detective. Uh, literature too um was uh, it wasn't that a genre that just came out of nowhere not nowhere but but uh, it was an unusual thing isn't there like a, an edgar Allan poe story that started or something a little bit before that something like that because there have you know detectives became a, is a new part of our culture relatively speaking um not that there weren't spies before and etc cetera, etc cetera, but it's a whole new thing that happens in basically the period of, of the high Victorian era, both in France and in England. You get a metropolitan police force. Uh, you mm-hmm. start to get things like fingerprinting. Uh, you, mm-hmm. you, you start to get technologies. And, and, and it really is very much related to urban crime and a kind of industrialization of, of mm-hmm. detection. So there were certainly detective stories uh, before, but, but also and then you get with Dostoevsky as well. So it's happening also in, in Russia. Uh, mm-hmm. All around the, these places, you get these these actual, you know, Scotland Yard. They, these things get formed, and then this this produces a way to focalize 
a lot of concerns, whether it is about crime, whether it is about industrialization, whether it's about city life. And that's why Holmes is, uh, Sherlock Holmes is so interesting to me as a, as a kind of London figure. What does that, what does that world uh, signify mm -hmm. for him? It's interesting, uh, in a way, Sherlock Holmes is uh, like a James Bond figure, somebody who, who figures everything out, everything goes their way, no matter what the enemies are, he, he vanquishes. So it, it's, it's before, before cartoons took over altogether uh, with Marvel. In a way, Sherlock Holmes, James Bond, you know, they are different character traits of what people want to be able to control. They want to be able to figure out what everything went, go, that went wrong with the crime, you know, and, and catch the people. And they want to live that life if you're a spy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they seem similar in character. Absolutely. No, it's a, very interesting. He's a kind of a rational superhero. And of course, yeah. some of the, the later uh, Sherlock Holmes movies, he starts to have like superhero qualities uh, that they, they yeah. can't resist <laughs> making him more of a Marvel hero than he was. <laughs> then you also get the very sophisticated, thoughtful reworkings of the Sherlock Holmes figure become mm -hmm. something very different. One of my uh, favorite books among the 80 is called The Mandala of Sherlock Holmes by Jamyang mm -hmm. Norbu, Tibetan postmodernist who knew there was such a category. <laughs> uh, so he publishes this novel in 1990. Nine uh, and and he's a, he's a activist who wants to make the general world aware of the struggles of Tibet against Chinese incursions, and he's been writing little essays uh, about this that almost no one reads. And then he realizes the global genre, the detective story, is something he can use to reach a worldwide public. Uh, and uh, do we have still a couple of minutes? To, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about uh, this. So, uh, and Norbu grows up loving both Kipling uh, and Conan Doyle. As, mm -hmm. as a young boy in exile in, in North India. Uh, and, and he realizes that uh, Conan Doyle kills off, uh, had killed off uh, Holmes uh, for a decade. And then he brings it back to life on the reader's demand uh, within the fiction, it's only two years later. And, and Holmes says he was away hiding from Moriarty and he went to Tibet and had some nice discussions with the Grand Lama. So Norbo <laughs> thinks, oh, I can use that. So he sets a murder mystery, first in Bombay, and then going up in, into Tibet, uh, in which it turns out that, that Holmes is a reincarnation himself of a, of a, of a spiritual figure. And he uses mm -hmm. this as a way of countering both Chinese imperialism, but also saying Tibet is a source for, that heals the difference between East and West or science and religion. It's mm -hmm. fascinating. Uh, and he has so much fun with it at the same time. Yeah, and he rewrites it. Uh, one of the comments that you make I thought was very interesting. You, you, you said that in, in America, uh, they didn't go with the mandala of Sherlock Holmes as the title. They went with Sherlock Holmes, the missing years. Yes. And it, 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 because maybe Americans wouldn't know what a mandala was. Um, and it, it, it reminded me of uh, that Scholastic decided that the philosopher's stone uh, with Harry Potter, the philosopher's stone wouldn't work because no one knows what a philosopher is uh, in America. So they call it the sorcerer's stone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, both of those choices on the publisher's part are, are a clear indication why we need a little bit more. <laughs> The knowledge about world literature uh, right. and what's going on in other places if, if we're, we're unaware of philosophers and mandalas. Mm -hmm. uh, they're relatively widespread. <laughs> At the same time, I think, um, I mean, that's why I think a useful introduction is very helpful. At the same time, a great work of literature will, will give you the information you need to, to understand it. And one of the differences between works that really thrive around the world and ones that stay locally. The, the local work can be just as brilliant, but you need too much cultural information to make sense of it. Whereas mm. uh, the works that I like to take are ones that are really very readable. Yeah. But one of the things that you, you, you did, um, because from your childhood, you talked about Dr. Doolittle. And uh, I, I wanted you to talk a little about that because I thought the background on that was really quite interesting. Yes. Uh, so here again, we have... Um, it goes back to World War One. So uh, Hugh Lofting is uh, is serving in the in the trenches in, in World War One, and he he's a he's a British Irish British guy who had moved to the U.S. But then he goes back to enlist in the Irish Guards during the war, and he's writing home to his little kids uh, in the East Coast of the U.S. Uh, but he everything is censored. He doesn't know what he can possibly actually really write about. But then he gets really struck by the fact that the horses were still being used heavily are, are not being well treated. They'll just be shot if they get wounded because there's there's not they can't really help them very well he said if only the doctor could talk to the horse and he said ah there's a story <laughs>
So, you know, there's yeah. no mention of, of World War I anywhere in the Voyages of Dr. Doodle or, or the whole series, right. but this is how it comes out and then sparks this amazing adventurous uh, sequence. Yeah, and, and it certainly taps into uh, young children's uh, ideas of being able to communicate with all kinds of uh, beings around them that they are either imagining or that are real. I mean, they, they certainly talk to their pets. Yeah. And then for me, I didn't think I could actually uh, talk to snails and, and birds, but well, I could learn more languages. So, you know, it's probably <laughs> his fault that I studied a dozen languages. <laughs> um, so, which of the books uh, that we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about? I mean, they, they, we, we didn't cover Japan. We didn't cover, there are, there are, I mean, way too much to cover, obviously. Um, and it's a great, you know, you don't have to take it as a, a travel around the world, but it's a great uh, look, your, your book is, a great look at what's going on in world literature today. What are the main things that it's based on? Um, and, and you introduce a lot of writers, but anybody that's been reading can recognize almost all the writers' names. They, they have made their way out. I mean, we could talk about Salman Rushdie, for example, and his situation, um, but, but what would you like to talk about? Well, interesting. Um, yeah, these are all such favorites of mine. Uh, one of the ones that uh, I particularly enjoyed working on, uh, Judith Shalansky has this amazing Atlas of Remote Islands, uh, which mm. the subtitle is 50 Islands I've Never Been to and Never Will. Uh, it's also <laughs> kind of like a perfect version of, of this project, because right. she does, and, but she doesn't want to go. And these are utopias, these are mostly dystopias, and, and it's a beautiful atlas. She's done a scale map of each of 50 islands, and facing it, there's a little description, kind of a prose, mm. prose poem. Uh, and it's just it's just wonderful. Uh, uh, it's a kind of way of thinking about about the world. And she uses historical sources and then, then plays with it. Uh, and it, I'd like it probably because it's a voyage of discovery about voyages of discovery. And then reading the book, these little hints, these little one page where well, you could go further. So one of the cases, mm -hmm. she, one of the islands she talks about is Puka Puka. And she quotes uh, a guy from America settling there. And he's, he's sort of fascinated by the native nudity. I thought, well, mm -hmm. where, where, what is she looking at? So, I, so I, I look up and I find the book by this guy whose name she mentions, uh, mm -hmm. though she doesn't mention the book. And then I find that he married uh, a, a, a Puka Pukan wife. Uh, and one of their kids is the first Polynesian woman to ever write uh, a, a novel uh, and a memoir mm -hmm. to pu publish books. Uh, and this makes me very happy. Uh, the, the book is really quite fascinating. She writes when she's 15 years old. She writes in mm -hmm. a mixture of English Rorotongan and Puka Pukan. Her father helps her tra translates it and gets it published in the, in the U.S. in the, in the 40s. Uh, and I have a sort of, in that chapter, a theme about Ulysses and the voyages of Ulysses with Walcott and then Margaret Atwood. Uh, and this, this, this Puka Pukan girl calls herself, her book is called Miss Ulysses of Puka Puka because she identifies mm -hmm. with Ulysses. Right. And so Sholansky's book leads to this other book, which leads back to Homer. It's just a perfect yeah. circle. Yeah, I thought... I. I'm glad you picked that example because I thought that was really great. And you also have a great picture of the father being so proud of his 15 year old yes. daughter, you know, yes. having written this book and everything like that. And it makes it very personal. And it also shows how, how, as you said, the literature flows out and flows back and flows back and forth. And there's, it's a conversation, the conversation. And why do we all have these conversations with each other? Cause you know, life is fairly incomprehensible. Um, and, and whatever help we can get, whatever other points of view we can get to make it make a little bit more sense, or at least what, choices we make in life uh, would, would, you know, work out better. Uh, I think that's what the conversation seems to be all about. Um, we're not lone wolves. Not very many of us anyway. Anyway, that was great. Uh, thank you very much, David, uh, for, uh, you know, discussing your book Around the World in 80 uh, Books. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. So ends another event uh, at the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thanks for joining us. And, you know, We'll see you more online next year. Thanks a Thank lot. Thank you, George. Thanks, David. Bye-bye.